Okay. So again, you're, you are addressing all four of these things in your essay when you're talking about syntax. It's not enough to merely list the types of syntax that are used. You can't say there are really long sentences and leave it at that. You have to actually um, analyze the purpose, the meaning, the effect, and how it helps the author achieve his or her purpose. If you're not going through these steps, you're just pointing at things. Have you guys ever watched Wheel of Fortune? Yes. You know, the woman who turns the, um, the letters, Vanna White, uh, was always, you know, the letter turner whenever I watched it growing up. And she'd just turn the letter and be like, D, or like whatever the letter is, right? That's what I see people do with literary terms. You're all like, simile. Metaphors. <laughs> Metaphors. Or like, you're like, there's rhyme. Wow. You know, or in the case of syntax, you'll be like, short declarative sentences. Wow. And then I'll be like, okay. So, you need to be more than just a show person <laughs> saying, see, you have to be a why person explaining the why. Now, the first thing that you can talk about when we talk about syntax is sentence length. All right? Sentence length. We have four different sentence lengths for you to look at. The first is telegraphic. A telegraphic sentence is shorter than five words. The reason they call it telegraphic is because in back when they had telegraphs, um, they would keep the messages super short. So a telegraphic sentence is shorter than five words. Put down the chocolate. Telegraphic sentence. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm not actually yelling at you, but did you notice how like how um, much impact that had? Put down the chocolate. Four words, and then automatically you're like, who's getting yelled at? That I was yelling. No. No. Mary Fuller's like, what chocolate? <laughs> um, no. So, next, you have a short sentence. A short sentence is five to ten words. It is not as, um, it's not as short, obviously, as a telegraphic sentence, but it is still pretty short. Doesn't have a lot of information there. Then you have a medium sentence, which is 15 to 20 words. And finally, you have a long sentence, which is approximately 30 words or more. Think of it this way. When I just said that telegraphic sentence, put down the chocolate, you know how tiny that was. When you go and you look at your sentences in your own writing, check and see. For my sentence length, how long are my sentences? And do I vary my sentence? Varying your sentence length helps to modulate your reader through the different emotions you want them to feel regarding your topic. <coughs> right? It creates tone. If I'm doing a lot of really tiny short sentences, then um, like telegraphic sentences, it creates more urgency. Think President Trump's Twitter account. <laughs> right? When he has his short sentences, he does it because he's trying to create a sense of urgency. When he has his long sentences, he's trying to sound smart. Even though he builds. Mm -hmm. All right. Questions about sentence length. Be careful. A lot of you I have seen in your writing have problems with long sentences. Because you have a lot to say, which is good that you have a lot to say. But one of the things you got to make sure you do is read your work out loud and hear what it sounds like. You modulate your grammar better verbally than you do in written word. The first thing that people, the first way people learn English um, or any language really is through speaking and hearing it. The hardest and the last thing that you get good at is the writing. Now, the next thing to look at is sentence beginnings and endings. You want to question, 
Is there a variety in your sentence beginnings and endings? So does it change at the beginning of every sentence? If it doesn't change, then a pattern is emerging, right? There are two different kinds of patterns that you might be seeing. Anaphora, which is the repetition of the first few words. And then the other one is epistrophe, which is the repetition of words at the end of a clause, phrase, or sentence. One of the uh, examples for anaphora that I always talk about is like in the Bible, how it says, in the beginning, da 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 in the beginning, da 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 in the beginning, da 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 where it says it again and again and again. That's your anaphora. So if there is anaphora, or if there is epistrophe, why? What does it do to repeat the beginning of the sentence or to repeat the end of the sentence so many times in a row? to your own writing. It is a stylistic tool that in your own essays you start off sentences with that repetition, that anaphora, or you end sentences with that repetition, the epistrophe, to reinforce whatever ideas you are creating. So, and it especially works in making arguments. If your parents are complaining that you don't do anything and you're making an argument to them, it's less effective to say, I do this, this, and this, than to say, I always do this, I always do this, I always do this. Because then you're repeating, I always, multiple times, really hits that point at home. Not that you would ever argue with your parents. Ever. Or anybody else. Everything's an argument. It's okay. Yeah. With literature, you can talk about literature in the same way. You have to make sure that when you're doing it, it is intentional, though, in your own writing. If you're writing your um, essay on her darkness, and you say, Conrad writes, da 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 da, Conrad writes, da 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 da. Conrad writes, da, 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 da. what's the purpose of saying Conrad writes so many times in a row? No. Like, what effect, are you trying to create an effect? If you're not creating an effect, an effect, then that repetition is a bad kind of repetition. Do you see what I mean? You want to make sure that if you are creating repetition, that it's for a reason. Otherwise, you get that negative comment of your essay is repetitive. It can be a good thing for it to be repetitive if you do it for a reason. It's a bad thing if there's no reason. Next, word order. You wanna look and think, are there words set out in a special way for a specific purpose or effect? So, in your piece, in your uh, analysis piece that you did last night where you uh, looked at a passage from Heart of Darkness, there's a lot of description in these passages I gave you, right? Why are those words, why, why do some words come before other words? What is the purpose of that? If an author is describing somebody as 
the character as a kind, generous, sometimes flighty girl. Why put kind and generous first and then put the sometimes flighty, which is like, to be flighty is to be like empty headed, kind of all over the place. Um, why put that last? Why put the emphasis on kind and generous? Why does that come first? You know, so you want to ask yourself that question of word order. Are these words set out in a special way for a specific purpose or effect? Y'all know it's rhetorical questions, right? Get it? What did I just do? Oh. I just asked you a rhetorical question. Y'all know rhetorical questions, right? You don't have to answer me. I mean, although it is nice to get an answer from there. But a rhetorical question is a question that expects no answer. If you guys had all said no, it wouldn't have changed what I was going over here, right? I'm asking that question just to introduce rhetorical questions. Asking a rhetorical question, or when a rhetorical question is used, it draws attention to a point or leads a reader to a specific view, answer, etc. So for example, if say that like my speech and debate team is having like all sorts of problems like drama, and I'm like, can't we all just get along? I don't expect them all to be like, no, and start yelling at each other, right? I don't, <laughs> maybe I don't want them to answer it because they're already drama anyway. They're not, I'm just using that as an excuse, as an example, excuse me. <laughs> can't we all just get along is meant to make them think like, oh, maybe we should. Rhetorical questions get asked all the time. Again, I will bring up your parents. Do you know why I'm mad at you today? And then you're like, you're not like necessarily really supposed to answer, and you just kind of like have to wait. And then, but then sometimes they're like, answer me, and you're like, I didn't know if I should answer or not. A lot of times rhetorical questions are used to elicit that thought from the audience. My um, kids were playing in the bathtub, and they're now too big to like really play in the bathtub because they're, they've got all these long legs and all these long arms, and they like end up hurting each other most of the time. And one of them, the bigger one, they were switching spots, and the bigger one didn't realize it, but she pushed the other one down under the water. Oh. And then the other one like came up coughing and choking and threw up. Oh. <laughs> But it was all in the bathtub, and so I ended up showering them down, and I was like, yeah. But, and I was just like, are you trying to kill your sister? Like, I don't, I'm not expecting her to be like, <laughs> no, because I know she's not trying to kill her sister. But it is meant to make her think of what the consequences would be. See? They love each other, they're great. <laughs> they wrestle too much. They do wrestle. <laughs> 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 and our little sister the other day was playing, was playing with like a, like a, uh, like a toy knife, like a little pocket knife, and like running around after the other one. So in my head, I'm like, this is, this is just like the older sister getting paid back for being stabbed. <laughs> anyway, rhetorical questions. <laughs> Next, you have the arrangement of ideas. So where you put the ideas in the sentence makes a difference. For example, if there is a loose sentence, it makes complete sense if brought to a close before the actual ending. The main point is front loaded. So for example, we finally reached San Diego that morning after a long delay, a turbulent flight, and some exciting adventures with airline crew. You could have cut it off at we finally reached San Diego and still understood. You could have cut it off with we finally reached San Diego that morning and still understood. You could have caught, cut it off with we finally reached San Diego that morning after a long delay and still understood. Do you see how it works? The main idea, we finally reached San Diego, is there at the top, and then the rest of the things are all just things that are added, right? 
You don't need the rest of the things to understand that sentence. The main ideas are already there. So where you put your ideas makes a difference. I have seen another thing that a lot of you do in your writing is that you put your main point at the end of the sentences. Like you're building up to like the big reveal. It's something that actually happens a lot in um, people who speak Spanish as one of their languages. It's something about the romance languages. I don't know, like you know when people in your, in your family tell stories, the main point is never at the beginning, it's always at the very end and you have to listen to like everything before they finally get to the point. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of times people who are Spanish speakers as well as English speakers, and they write in English, will do that with their sentences. Where your main point is at the beginning, it's at the end, and you have like a whole bunch of stuff going on, and it's like, wait a minute, let's rearrange this. You put the main stuff at the beginning, it's more direct. You put the main stuff at the end, why? What is the point? Why is all that other stuff there first? So when you're looking at um, Joseph Conrad and his writing, which you know he was not a native English speaker, um, you're gonna wanna think like, okay, so like, where is the, like, the meat of his sentence and why would he put all the other stuff before it? What is the point? What is the effect? There's also the periodic sentence. The periodic sentence is that opposite, where it makes sense only when the end of the sentence is reached. The main point is endless. So for example, that morning after a long delay, a turbulent flight, and some exciting adventures with airline food, we finally reached San Diego. I don't understand anything about the sentence until I get to the end. Some of you even do periodic sentences without the end. But then I'm like, oh, what's the point of my sentence? <laughs> so if the, if the point is at the end, if it's end loaded, why? What is the purpose of using those periodic sentences? So when you're doing your paragraph in your essay that specifically looks at syntax of the sentences, you should be saying what kind of sentence are being used and what the effect is. Don't just be like, here's a periodic sentence. It's end loaded. And I'll be like, okay, so why? To what effect? What is the point? So I'm gonna white it. Periodic sentence. Okay, and and then I will post to this PowerPoint along with the video onto Classroom at the same time. And that way you guys have that to review. All right. The third kind of arrangement of ideas is parallel structure. So parallel structure is when you have grammatic or structural similarity between sentences or parts of a sentence. So it involves the arrangement of words, phrases, sentences, and paragraphs so that elements of equal importance are equally developed and similarly draped. In essence, a particular kind of repetition. So you could see anaphora as parallel structure if it is repeated, but you can also see parallel structure within sentences, and you can see parallel structure within paragraphs. So if your paragraphs are all structured the same way, why? What is the if the sentences are all structured the same way. If you have several periodic sentences in a row, that's parallel structure, what? One of the famous examples is when you look in, in a single sentence is when you hear I came, I saw, I conquered, which translated into Latin is vini, vini, vini. I came, I saw, I conquered. I this, I this, I this. That is parallel structure. I, verb. I, verb. I, verb. Why? 
what does that parallel structure do? It puts an emphasis on the individual, the I. So, in the winter, I usually like skiing and to skate. In the winter, I usually like skiing and skating. In the winter, I usually like to ski and skate. Why are the bottom two parallel and the first one not? Why is the first one wrong? Why is it not parallel? <laughs> yes. Exactly. So when you look at right, skiing and skating, they both end in ing. Or ski and skate, they're both the same tense, right? So when you're creating parallel structure, or when you're looking for parallel structure, notice this kind of thing. Okay. Next up, we have the natural order sentence. This is a sentence where the subject comes before the predicate, the main verb. So oranges grow in California. This is like the most simple of sentences that you learn from the very beginning. Subject, verb. Subject, verb. You could even shorten it to oranges grow. Subject, oranges. What do they do? Grow. Then you have the inverted order sentence. That's where the predicate, the main verb, comes before the subject. So in California, grow oranges. Does that make sense? Not particularly, because for our logic, we like to hear in English our subject first. Or a split order sentence. It divides the predicate into two parts with the subject coming in between. For example, in California, oranges grow. Both of these convolute or confuse the reader because in English, like I said, we usually have a subject coming before the verb. So if you're reading something and the subject comes after the verb, you need to ask yourself, why? What is the purpose of doing that? Inward order sentence where the predicate comes before the subject, and the split order where the predicate is divided into two parts with the subject coming in between.
Then there's the interrupted order. This is where the subordinate elements come in the middle, often set up by dashes, like oranges, beautiful, sweet, and delicious, grow in California. And you know anytime you see dashes, the information in the middle, in between those dashes, should give some kind of detail to the subject. So beautiful, sweet, and delicious are like adjectives to describe oranges, right? It's more information about oranges. So if you see dashes, anything in between the dashes should be giving you more information about the subject. So when you're looking at your piece, if there are dashes, why? What is the point of giving you that extra information that is in between those dashes? What purpose does the author serve? What tone does it create? How does it, you know, advance the theme? And then you have the sentence classification. I think that you work with these in Lang, right? Declarative sentences, imperative sentences, interrogative sentences, and exclamatory sentences. The declarative makes a statement, the king seems sick. You look tired. I want chocolate. The imperative gives a command. Help him now. Do your homework. Give me chocolate. The interrogative asks a question. What's the matter with him? Why don't you do your homework? Why don't you bring me more presents? And exclamatory makes an exclamation. The king is dead. I'm really bad with exclamation points. I'm like not the exclamation. Except when I have to write emails and I'm trying to be nice, then I end up using too many exclamation points. Like, good morning, exclamation point. I hope you're doing well. Smiley face. I really could use this help with this da 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 da. Period. Thank you so much, exclamation point. Yeah. And then I have to go back and be like, oh, be more direct. But too many exclamation points like lessens the effect of them. It's not surprising anymore. Instead, you just look like L Woods. You know, the four basic sentence structures, simple, one independent clause, compound, two or more independent clauses. My third grader is learning about these right now. It's a simple sentence, the singer bowed, bowed sorry, to her adoring audience, compound sentence, the singer bowed gratefully to the audience, but she sang no encores. We have two independent clauses that are combined with a comma and a conjunction. If you have two independent clauses, you always have to have a comma and a conjunction or a semicolon. Or just make it two separate sentences.
number three. The other two, complex sentences and compound complex. So complex sentence has one independent clause and one or more dependent subordinate clauses. A subordinate clause depends on the main clause to make sense. Although the singer vowed gratefully to her audience, she sang no encore. She sang no encores can stand by itself. The first half is dependent, it's subordinate. By itself, it doesn't make sense. Although she, the singer bowed gratefully to her audience, what, right? It is dependent on that other part. And then compound complex, where you have two or more independent clauses and one or more dependent clauses. Although the audience clapped wildly, the singer sang no encores, but she did bow grace, gratefully. So you have two separate pieces, the singer sang no encores and she did bow gratefully, which can stand on their own. But then you still have a dependent clause in although the audience clapped well. If I took out the although, it wouldn't be dependent anymore. The audience clapped wildly. That makes the audience the subject. When you say although the audience may clap, clap wildly, wildly, I'm wondering what our subject is, what our point is. And guess what? That's it. Yay!